Uh, we'll get started in just a little bit, but please make sure you've muted your own microphones and hidden your videos for now so we can highlight the presenters as they continue on. Today, we're really pleased to have a uh, talk about institutional effectiveness. What is it? How does student affairs engage in the process? And then uh, Dr. Bob Wilkinson is Director of Institutional Research and Effectiveness at Bemidji State University. Dr. Nicholas Santilli is a Senior Director of Learning Strategy with the Society for College and University Planning. And Dr. Megan Schramm-Poschenker, the Assistant Professor and Director of Student Success Analytics with Renthrop University. And I'm Vince, I'm the moderator today. So we're really pleased that you are with us. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our presenters. Okay, I'm Bob Wilkinson. And what we're gonna do is first, we wanna give you uh, an understanding of what institutional effectiveness is, then introduce you to integrative planning and how it advances institutional effectiveness, give you a better understanding of the integral role of student affairs plays with regard institutional effectiveness and integrative planning, and then help you derive several actionable strategies. Next. Okay. How often have you found, where'd we go there? How often have you found that as you're sitting, you find out that multiple parts of your organization are doing the same thing? As the slide shows, they're both looking at how to eliminate redundancies in their processes. Well, institutional effectiveness is to help you increase the effectiveness and efficiency of your organization. Next. You're gonna get a lot of material, so don't, don't get frightened by what you hear. We want you to think about everything and how you might use it. We're gonna kind of overload you with stuff. So just kind of listen, pay attention and take notes and it'll all make sense when we're done. Okay, so what is institutional effectiveness? Let's work on a definition. <clears throat> Let's start with a poll. I'm not quite sure how we do the polls. I've never done one before, to be quite honest. Okay, indicate which of the four, I have never heard of institutional effectiveness. I've heard of it, but not sure what it is. I know what it is, and my institution has started to embrace it, and my institution fully embraces institutional effectiveness. Okay, I think we're stuck on 38. Do you want me to end the poll or leave it open a little bit more? It may just yeah, be because well, the three of us are not voting. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we do? Okay, here are the results. You see, you can see those results, right? Oh, wow. 45% they know what it is and the institution has started to embrace it. 32% think they know what it is and 21% say that the institution fully embraces. Very good. Okay, let's go to the next slide and we'll put all this in some form of context. Let's have a definition. There's what's called the Association for Higher Education Effectiveness and they define integrated institutional effectiveness as the purposeful coordination and integration of functions that foster student success 
and support institutional performance, quality, and efficiency. And those functions would include planning, assessment, institutional research, and accreditation program review and such. However, I think there's a more comprehensive definition. Next slide. Using the AHEE definition as a start, I would say institutional effectiveness is the purposeful coordination and integration of institutional function and processes that support institutional performance, quality, and efficiency within the framework of the triad of teaching and learning, discovery and engagement, meaning it's mission specific. You look at the mission of your institution and what are the purposes for which you exist? And then you cast institutional effectiveness within your mission. Now the, <clears throat> you include planning, assessment, institutional research, and regional accreditation program review and unit review in that, but you get more mission specific. Next slide. Now, what I want you to do, we're gonna look at three models of institutional effectiveness. And I want you to look at them and look at the similarities among the models. And this is the first one. And what I want you to notice is we start with the mission, we go through the vision, we have the strategic plan, tactical plans, and then we start bringing together the annual academic and administrative unit plans. But we also have the external analysis, internal analysis, and then we have a feedback loop. So it's a continual process where we learn about the organization, we look at our measures and we close the loop and we continue on. Pretty straightforward. Next slide. This one gets a little more complex. Across the top, we have inputs, processes, outcomes and impacts. Same as the other model. We're looking at what's the strategic plan we, we mass put that with the master plan, the other, the other levels of planning and assessment, and we get to outcomes and impacts. What are, what are the performance measures? Across the bottom, we have who is involved, and it includes the entire institution. Okay, let's, let's go to the last slide, the next slide. This one looks a little more convoluted, but it's not. We started at the top with the Board of Regents. We worked through the organizational structure. We have internal and external. You see the Board of Visitors, President's Cabinets involved, the Administrative Councils. And then we have the different councils of importance to the institution. There's assessment planning, data, then we tie together the different parts of the institution. We have advancement, economic development, academic affairs, student affairs, and then all the units underneath. Again, everything aligns and is coordinated throughout the structure. So what is it that is similar across all the different models you'd look at. Let's go to the next slide. And there are certain commonalities. And the first is the integration of all institutional planning. We align the organization, be it the institution plan aligns, the unit plans align with departmental plans, with college plans, with the institution's plan, the enrollment, all that aligns. It includes the institution's strategic plan, unit level planning. There's assessment built in, so we're collecting data and performance measures. We have the direct assessment of student learning. Program review gets involved. And then institutional research and use of data 
again, performance measures to close the loop. And in a real brief summary, that's institutional effectiveness. Let's go to the next slide. And I think we go to Nick. Yes, we do. So Vince, there we go. There's the poll uh, on, the, on, the on the question of uh, practicing integrated planning. So if you take a moment, choose one of these four alternatives and then we'll, we'll begin to move on. Uh, what uh, what I will do is is do what Bob very similar to what Bob did you know sketch out the nature of the environment in which we are working uh, provide a model for integrated planning and then show how integrated planning can be implemented on a campus so Vince how are those results looking yeah we have uh, 25 30 we're counting when it gets Great. up to where 90 percent it stopped last time I'll Give it a couple of seconds and then let you Okay, know. great. Sounds great. We're at 32, so please cast your votes. Okay. 70, 75% and counting upward. All right. So if you're not familiar with the Society for College and University Planning, it is a membership association, <laughs> you know, higher ed institutions and those corporate entities that help support planning on campuses. It could be architecture firms, construction firms, consulting firms, uh, all of these uh, landscape architecture, all of that uh, are, are our membership. And then everyone uh, within the institution of higher education who has or has touched by planning on their campus. So as we see here, uh, you can see the, the results that the most popular response was you've heard of integrated planning or integrated planning, but not really sure if we um, uh, have not reached integration of your campus plans. And then, uh, you know, it's really, you know, nice to see that uh, some of your campuses practice it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very, very important that, um, or in your division, which is also very important as well, because one of the things that's really significant about taking an integrated planning approach is alignment across the institution. And then some of you have never heard of integrated planning. I think one of the things that uh, is very, very important for me to mention at this point uh, and something to follow up on is that the language of integrated planning and institutions doing systematic integrated planning, it, that language has now been included in all of the regional accreditation bodies criteria or standards. So it's not just enough now to do strategic planning or operational planning. Campuses must demonstrate evidence of integrated planning uh, as you begin to dem you know, demonstrate uh, how well you're using resources and how you're using integrated planning as an approach within your overall institutional effectiveness models. So it's really significant that uh, you gain a greater awareness of what integrated planning is. And quite frankly, I'm giving you the fire hose course on integrated planning here in the next few minutes. So uh, like Bob, I have quite a bit of information, mostly because I wanted to leave you with things to think about. So uh, let's get to it. Often what I like to do in most presentations is to recognize our present state. We are working in a state of volatility. You know, certainly individuals know uh, that, you know, coming through the pandemic uh, is, is still a work in progress for institutions, but, you know, it's always been volatile in higher ed. You know, a year ago, I was giving presentations on the enrollment cliff and how to use integrated planning uh, in response to the enrollment cliff that is pending uh, middle of this decade, really. But, you know, really thinking about the notion of volatility, as you see, uh, there is an acronym that captures it nicely. Vince, go ahead and move to the next slide. And that's VUCA, V-U-C-A, as you see here, volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity in the environment. And really what this is referring to is how the external environment is changing and placing pressure on your internal environment. So it, you know, there, the volatility of the environment is something that's important to think about. Not only do we have a pandemic, but we also have racial equity and social justice movements on our camp, you know, toward our uh, pressures on our campuses. Uh, the business model is un still under question on our campuses. The relevance of higher education uh, is, is still being questioned 
on our campuses and in the environment. So all of these things create a volatility in our environment that leads to uncertainty. And what do human beings like the least about an environment is that it's uncertain because you can't predict things. You don't know, you can't be comfortable. So it's really uh, difficult. And how to handle the uncertainty is important. Also, our problems are complex. You know, they're not simple problems. They are complex problems that we are faced as responding to the, the volatility and uncertainty in the environment. And we live in the gray space. It's not black and white. I, I you know, it's one of the things I, I used to tell my students uh, when I was teaching on campus uh, that we often have to live in the gray. You know, there is a degree of ambiguity in our world and we need to find ways to become more comfortable about the ambiguity that we're faced with. So Vince, the next slide, thanks. So integrated planning, you know, the, uh, as, um, as I'm working in the association as I have for almost three years now, but that's after 34 years on a college campus. Um, I worked uh, in higher education and academic affairs. I'm a developmental psychologist by training, no college student development work. Uh, it was a good partner with student affairs colleagues on my campus uh, and moved into integrated planning as I moved into academic administration in some of the work that I did and have adopted this model that we use at the Society for College and University Planning. What I want to point to are the four uh, light blue words here. Higher, you know, integrated planning is, an, is a sustainable approach. You build a planning culture and now it becomes part of the fabric of the institution. It builds relationships. Bob was talking about the significance of relationships for, integrated, uh, for institutional effectiveness. It's the same for integrated planning. It aligns the institution and helps you prepare for change. And at the bottom, all it does is, again, reinforce what Bob mentioned regarding institutional effectiveness is that it takes a campus and more. It takes a campus and all of your external stakeholders as well to help drive planning and thriving for your students and your campus. Next slide, please. So these are the basic forms of institutional planning. At the heart of a planning portfolio is integrated planning, but it's, it is not a, a, a methodology itself. It's really a discipline, and it collects uh, the various methodologies of planning that you see here on this slide. Uh, and you know, each one of these has its place and its role in creating a robust uh, portfolio of planning for an institution. Next slide, please. Strategic and operational planning are part of what I like to describe as your regular cycles of institutional planning. Strategic planning typically occurs on a three-year or five-year cycle at most institutions. Uh, there are some planning uh, models that are, are uh, look actually at setting uh, new initiatives yearly, sort of adding a, you know, adding a, an initiative or a, a strategic initiative every year. Uh, and some may actually build a 10 year plan. I've not seen many of those much any longer because the environment is shifting so quickly. Basically, anytime you begin to think about, you know, projecting outward past three or four years, you really need a, a magic eight ball. So, you know, in terms of thinking about, the, you know, strategic planning, Three to five, three or five year cycles are common. Operational planning is that yearly operational planning that you do that's often tied to resource allocation planning as well. So it's not just budget cycles, it is other resources like IT, HR, and facilities. Thanks, Vince. Now, the other three types of planning, scenario, continuity, and contingency planning, or I'd like to call context specific kinds of planning methodologies. You don't do them on a scheduled cycle. You typically do them as needed. Many institutions spent the last year scenario planning, trying to figure out what types of uh, elements of the environment would exist and how would we respond as an institution. Typically, scenario you create various scenarios based on shifts in the external environment and then you move to contingency planning. So if this scenario is going to come to pass, here is how we will respond as an institution. 
So a good bit of institutional work on the planning side in these areas has been around proceed, you know, developing scenarios that may occur uh, over the short term or, or even five to seven years out by watching the external environment and then creating contingencies to respond if certain scenarios become more and more probable. It's not guessing. You're not guessing about the future. You are identifying significant environmental trends that have a high probability of influencing your campus. And then continuity planning, anybody in the business office or in IT, you know, certainly knows about continuity planning. It's continuity of operations. And I would suspect that many of you also have continuity plans with respect to what might happen if we have a residence hall go down. And you have, you know, you have a set of contingencies and continuity plan to have that work as you think about uh, the work that you do uh, with, within the areas of your responsibility. So Vince, go ahead. Now, one of the things that I like to do is provide a, a framework to try to understand the dynamics of integrated planning. This outline list goes with the next slide. So Vince, if you move to the next slide, uh, you know, this is what I like to try to use as a more dynamic model of integrated planning for institutions, that you start with an institution's uh, core purpose or its context, mission, vision, and values that moves to trying to understand the experience of the institution in planning. You know, thinking about the life of the institution gives you an opportunity to reflect on what you've done well and what your challenges are and remain to be looking into the future and then moving towards action, design plans to help you align the institution and, and place it in a place where students can thrive and the institution can thrive. And then finally, evaluate, evaluate, evaluate. Planning is mission driven and data informed. You know, when you look at you know, evaluation, metrics, key performance indicators, all of these kind of things that you, um, you develop to be able to keep track of initiatives as they're implemented. Next slide, Vince, please. Thank you. So I, I have a couple of, of non-negotiable foundational things that to wrap up my talk here that help us understand integrated planning. First is the role of institutional leadership. Institutional leadership is key to success for integrated planning. Next slide, please, Vince. You know, basically leading change is what we're talking about here. It's not just managing change. Executive leadership needs to be invested and supportive of any integrated planning effort. You need to organize for planning on your campus. You identify who your stakeholders are, you know, both on campus and off campus. Will you use existing governance uh, structures to work uh, towards uh, your planning process? Who are your campus champions? Who are those opinion makers? I guess today it's influencers. Who are your campus influencers to really begin to think about how you engage them and then clearly define the roles and responsibilities of everyone involved in planning, the committees, the subcommittees, the senior leadership team, steering committee, clearly define who decides on uh, you know, you know, initiatives, who decides the timetable, who approves recommendations, which bodies only make recommendations, and who informs the process. How do you go about getting information from stakeholders, for example? Next slide, please. So collaborative governance is the next key component uh, to have uh, a, you know, go, uh, uh, planning work. In this case, what I've done is, is developed a, uh, a diagram here where collaborative governance is at the center. So if you want to have a healthy functioning collaborative governance uh, process on your campus, uh, the kinds of things that it, that it impacts uh, on the outer ring. And this was after some work that I had done with an institution trying to help them you know, uh, overcome some governance problems on their campus. And what, what I found was, is that the things in the outer ring were the symptoms of dysfunction lack of respect, lack of trust, lack of fairness, poor morale, uh, poor communication, uh, difficulty around institutional effectiveness for the same reasons that Bob described, you know, thinking about how institutional effectiveness works, it is driven by governance. You know, you have governance committees and entities that are in, involved in institutional effectiveness. They're also involved in planning. Your constituent relationships, the relationship between faculty and staff and administration and students and the board, 
all of these groups of individuals uh, have a stake in the governance of the institution. Some are more intimately involved than others, but they all have a stake in governance. So once you get the outer ring right, it begins to give you a sign that you're getting to a collaborative governance environment. And as you can see in the bullets on the side, it helps you function in a volatile environment. It relies on cross-functional relationships. People matter. Your institutional culture matters. All plans and all planning are a product of institutional culture. And you really want to try to use your existing governance structures to help the planning process along. And yes, exactly. Thank you, Renee. People matter. Uh, it is a people process, and it really is key uh, that you think about how you treat people and how, how your groups of stakeholders, how your people are engaged. It's really, really important because ultimately we'd like to work with shared purpose. So Vince, um, the next slide, finally, institutional alignment. Uh, and this really begins to help you understand the nature of integrated planning. One of the things I'm sure that you recognize within your institutions is, is that you don't lack for plans. I mean, it seems that, you know, institutions have plans. There are recovery plans. There's, you know, there, there are strategic plans, strategic plans for the institution, strategic plans for divisions, strategic plan for the college, all of the you know, strategic plans for departments, all of these kinds of things become important. Well, how are they aligned with the overall mission, vision, and purpose of the institution? So one of the ways to think about this is how they are, how your plans are aligned up, as I like to say, up, down, and sideways. So if you look at a department level plan, uh, an academic department or, you know, for example, the um, Office of Residence Life or Office of Student Activities, how do they, you know, how does the work that they're doing at the unit level, at that, that ground level, track upwards to the institutional strategic plan? How are you advancing the institution through the work you do in your area? And that's where you begin to look at alignment and how alignment can help institutions, you know, progress uh, and, and continue to advance that shared vision. So Vince, the next uh, slide, please. These are just other ways of, as Bob provided a couple of examples, these are just other ways of looking at alignment activity, you know, if when you look across the institution, some of those other areas that are aligned, and, and then both, you know, not uh, across the institution, but also up and down and how they also uh, refine and um, in, mutually influence one another. How do you take the, the collective activity of the institution and find ways to align it in meaningful ways? Thanks, Vince. Next slide. Yeah, this is just a smaller version of a vertical and a horizontal. Uh, just to highlight specifically when you can begin to think about the various kinds of planning and the various kinds of activities that need to be aligned uh, both up, down, and sideways within an institution. Thanks, Vince. So here we go, Megan. I'll hand it off to you. Well. Um, thank you very much for having me today. And we'd like to start by talking about assessment in student affairs and how we also can think about integrated planning and institutional effectiveness. And just as a preface, we'd like to know to what extent do you feel the student affairs division at your institution is identifying student needs as well as assessing their satisfaction, attitudes, and involvement? And so it really goes into gradation from very involved to involved, not very involved, or not engaged. So please choose the, the circle that matches your experience. We're very interested in understanding more about what other people are thinking and experiencing. And um, we are going to have everybody go in breakout rooms later and talk about that some more. So wait till those results come in. I didn't vote. Should I be voting? So peer pressure, I just voted. <laughs> All right, we're almost there. Okay, let's see the truth, everybody. Okay. 
So 41% of us, uh, and I am included in that because that is what I voted for, assess some variables, but not systematically. So when you think about that, um, almost half, we're not quite there, but there are quite a few institutions who are grappling with some siloed, if you will, assessment. Um, so some of the folks have indicated 22% or almost one in five that you're assessing some of the items, which is also, I think, very typical. And oh, 20, 19%, so this is a really good number, are very involved in assessing all the variables listed above. Um, I was surprised that 15% of you indicated that you have integrated planning that's robustly executed on your campus. And then we have folks who are in that position, 16 and 3%, not very involved in assessment or not engaged in assessment other than for compliance. And I think that's something that we really need to talk about today. Okay, next slide, please. So in thinking about assessment for student affairs, this really goes back to exactly what Nick and Bob talked about, that we want our assessment to be providing us with data that enables us to have institutional effectiveness. And we know that student affairs is absolutely integral, that whether students are satisfied with their experience, they're retained, and their success is very much a function of the student affairs division and the services they provide. But having said that, what we also see is that while we do have in the right hand, upper right hand corner, the career center or service learning, we also have faculty supplemental instruction. So we basically have instances where in which academic affairs may institute something like SI for different units that can really move the needle in terms of reducing DFW rates and improving student success. We also can see that while residence life and dining, the library, um, these are really important parts of the campus. I think we've all had surveys that indicate the degree to which students enjoy the food at their institution, not always so much. Um, and I even found at my former institution that going to the library is strongly and positively correlated with retention. So we know that's important. But we also know the power of the McNair program, of TRIO, of special programs for students who, let's say, are provisionally admitted. Advising, that's a huge part of how we have these touch points and meaningful avenues for support and growth for our students. But we also have on the student affairs side, leadership opportunities, engagement, opportunities for belonging. And then if we look in the other quadrant up on the upper left-hand side, we know that counseling, which is huge now with the number of mental health issues our students are facing, um, our health offices, our athletics, our gyms and wellness centers, and where we deal with student issues is pivotal to our students and part of student affairs. But we also know that we have academic success centers. We have honors colleges, we have tutoring, we have the study abroad experience, the International Center, and these are also very important. So when we look at student success, we look at retention, every facet of this diagram has to be part of the equation in discerning how well we are doing. And that really is exactly the same as what Nick said about integrated planning. Next slide, please. So when we think about that, Ultimately, what we wanna know is how do we even know what's working? How do we know for whom these services are most beneficial? How do we know where to invest our resources? And importantly, are we even meeting our mission and to what extent do we have evidence of that? And I'm not talking about the evidence that we have that makes it seem as if we are in compliance with an external group. I mean honest evidence regarding the degree to which we're advancing the student success that we intend to advance. And part of that is starting to really dig into, well, what messaging have our students received? Are they getting different kinds of letters from their advisor that differ from um, student affairs, that differ from the tutoring center? Do we have any sense of whether our students have multiple touch points and are getting messages 
from various entities that are pertinent to our students. To what extent do we have student involvement? Now, we all know that typically you want to have more student involvement as a mechanism for getting students engaged and retained. However, there are times when there's too much involvement on behalf of students, maybe not so much during COVID, but other times you'll have freshmen that are too involved and that is an impediment to their academic success. Additionally, you might find you have commuter students and those students might have friends from home, friends from high school, and maybe may be very content with their experience at your institution, irrespective of whether they joined a club. And so we really have to understand those differences in terms of our students' needs. And then we have to think too about academic concerns and how are we leveraging all aspects of the university, especially student life, to think about how we can work together to deal with and to support our students who are showing evidence of having academic concerns. So for example, if you have an alert system for student affairs that indicates whether you have students who are at risk, and then you have a separate alert system, let's say through an academic success center, and that's indicating whether students are at risk, all of a sudden you're in a position where you don't have alignment between discerning what kinds of concerns and needs your students have. And not only can you not act quickly and in a co coordinated manner that really fortifies the student's support, but you also may find out four months later when the student's already gone that he or she needed certain kinds of support. And I think that also brings back the idea that student affairs can't be on the side of assessment, meaning peripheral. It has to be part of the center. It has to be integrated with our other units. This is all part of one complete package that we need to assess. And finally, we also want to think about protective factors. So this is not going to surprise anyone. Athletes at our institution are better retained. Okay, this is probably not a huge shocker. But if we know that we have certain protective factors for certain students, and we also know that there are certain students who need more protective factors because they're at risk, then we should be able to have risk stratification. So we can say to our friends in student affairs, how are we deploying these assets in order to maximize the degree to which students with different needs are having their needs met? And that's why this assessment is so important. Next slide, please. So in thinking about this, we really have to unpack our procedures. And first, ask the question that Nick posed and that Bob mentioned. What are we trying to accomplish? What is our mission and for whom? And then how can we think about what it would look like to actually achieve those goals? What are the measurable outcomes that we want to achieve? And are those logical? Then we really have to think preemptively in the integrated planning process, what are the measures we're going to use in order to discern whether those outcomes have been met? And this is something that warrants lots of attention because there are times where you'll look at a plan and you'll see that there could be 35 initiatives within one part of one college and each one of those ostensibly has a measure, okay? You cannot see the forest for the trees if you have lots of little tiny discrete pieces of information coming in. You have to collectively stand back and say, what are we trying to do? How will we measure it using maybe three measures or two measures? That's how we understand how well we're performing. Then when we have the plan implementation, we have to really make sure that the plan is implemented as it's intended to be implemented. Do we have fidelity of implementation? And then upon completion of that, when we start to do our assessment, it isn't really upon completion. It's really as the plan is occurring, which includes that we have to find some complex things. And I mean complex in that it's very hard to get attendance data, participation data from lots of different entities in a campus. But we need that data because if we have a plan to have, let's say, um, a, an experience that fosters belonging, and the five people that go to every single event come to ours, then guess what? 
it's great for those five people, but we've missed the 25 that we actually wanted to come. So we have to know that, we have to assess that. And then finally, we really need to sit down and interpret our results and sometimes even interrogate them. Does this make sense? Are we really, does this really seem valid or, or actionable to us? And then go back and think of how this goes into our feedback loop where we can continue to clarify where we're at. But every one of these processes is absolutely integral. Next slide, please. So in just thinking of some action items, preliminarily, we know that we really have to think, is our mission really our mission or is it some artifact of the past that we have that doesn't clearly describe what our goals really are or for whom we really are trying to serve our students using the assets that we have. Secondly, we have to sit down and before enacting these strategies, we have to think what are the measures that we're using and we can't use 50 of them. We have to have a circumscribed set of measures and we have to assess what can be measured. Then we have to have data collection plans. So it doesn't mean, you know, one person can't do all of this. We have to rely upon our partners and that's also where integrated planning comes into play. But we have to assess too, to what extent did this event or let's say our um, outreach, did that even occur in a way that we intended it for to occur? And then finally, we have to have mechanisms for data integration. So we have to take some of our data from one area, which could be the Academic Success Center. We have to merge that with our data from, let's say, student affairs. And we have to start having these longitudinal data sets that enable us to see the student picture over time. Um, we have to have someone who oversees this. We need the manpower. And then we also have to think, well, are we ascertaining information in a manner that's timely enough that we can actually do something with it? And is it integrated, as Nick said, part of our overall planning? Are the data democratized so that people actually know what's going on in the campus and that everyone has an opportunity to see the student data in a way that does not compromise the student, but enables them to really be a player and own the process? And then finally, and I think this is something that we could talk about for a long time, what is our systematic communication plan? Do we have a mechanism for ensuring that we're sharing information across and within units as Nick depicted so that we really can have an effective campus and the institutional effectiveness that Bob described because we have to close the loop. So what we're going to do is go to our next slide and we're gonna ask you, we want to know what you think. And so the next slide describes what we want you to be thinking about with your group. So you're going to be assigned to a breakout room and you might be in a position where you might not have time for introductions, um, but you want to look at the question that you have, start posing some answers, collaborating together, type that in the Padlet, and then we're going to reconvene and we want to know what you think. We wanna leave this session with a set of actionable approaches that tap on the wisdom and expertise of this group. So please go ahead and enjoy your breakout session. We'll see you soon. And as we're breaking out, we wanna think, what are the strategies that have worked at your institution in student affairs assessment? And what would you recommend other institutions enact? So people are joining the rooms and uh, Renee, I could move the four of us to a different room, but I don't know that I have another room. <laughs> you've, you've exceeded my knowledge. That? You're fine. Uh, we'll just let everyone go to their rooms and um, everybody can leave their room. So if our, our presenters go, we'll just 
yeah, pull them wow. back or if they want to engage in conversation, exactly. that's awesome too. So they did. That's awesome. Oh, now they get 60 seconds. Sorry, I should have clicked it then. I forgot that. Okay, welcome back everyone. So my group, um, we were having fun talking and I feel bad because we could have, we were on a roll here. So um, I think we'd like to review the group's answers and start to distill those and think of some actionable ideas for next steps. So I sort of can see these, but it's a tiny bit small. So maybe we could make it a little bit larger. Well, let's see, it doesn't work. I can let our um, folks know that in our group, at least, it sounds like there is a need for more collaboration, less siloed operations, um, definitely a need for asking better questions that are less compliance driven and yes, I'm doing a good job and more informative regarding what it is that students are learning and what they're gaining from different experiences. We also heard about the utility of EAB data as a mechanism for linking student data across the campus so that you can see the same person and how many things he or she has attended and you can also see who has not attended. Um, and then finally, that the issue of democratizing data and making it available to people quickly is something that has to happen. And when you have impediments where you can't get the data, that that obviously precludes you from continuous improvement. So let's see, Vince, you want to read out some of our other notes here? Yes. So am I muted? Yeah. Okay. So here we, <clears throat> excuse me. There were no votes there. We've got EAB data. Identify who is missing from student service usage. Do certain students use certain services or do the same students use all services? Uh, do surveys for all campus members. Expand past satisfaction. I think that's past satisfaction to learning outcomes. Right. So go beyond satisfaction to learning outcomes. And then on the uh, what, what recommendations to effectively engage in student affairs assessment, we need more collaboration, share unit and departmental missions, make known the missions and work of each student affairs unit, how they connect to the larger division and institutional mission, vision, values, and goals, and encourage and empower all to fully engage within their lanes. Interesting. Leaders need to emphasize data sharing for assessment rather than hoarding for data protection. Here, here. <laughs> Discuss across SA divisions to break down silos, include academic affairs, faculty affairs, if learning outcomes are of interest. And I saw someone typing again on the measurements. I thought, no, it didn't. So that's all we have typed there right now. Well, um, I would agree that all of those things are excellent next steps. And they these are problems that we all share together. And so the more we can work as a thought community to advance our knowledge of this and come up with some strategic methods for combating these issues, the better. I just heard that podcast that was, um, it, I believe it was conducted Friday and Keston Fulcher had said, we have great data and assessment specialists, but in the absence of these uh, coordinated environments and communication systems, it really doesn't matter. So I think that speaks to what Nick talked about. So Vince, do you wanna go for final thoughts? Or yeah, so, so we could open it up for any other questions in the chat. We still have four minutes. If anybody wants to type a question, um, that would be fine. We will, I will read the question to them. And if I can't keep up with you, Dr. Delgado Raleigh will rein me back in and <laughs> hopefully assist. So, um, 
it looks like we're not having more chat. I wanted to say, I really enjoyed this. This was fascinating because as I was sharing with Renee while you were in the breakout rooms, I started in institutional effectiveness over student services and career and technical education, that, that side of the academic house back in 2014. And the premise was, it was under the Northwest Accreditor, NWCCU. So the premise was it had to start with shared governance. And I thought it was interesting that Bob didn't use that term, but Nicholas did in the overall model, collaborative governance. And I was thinking while that was going, I was like, wow, in eight years, this is, it's really been a shift. And I knew about integrated planning, but I didn't know there was a society that put it in such a, a nice uh, presentation format as you did. So I wish you all three would come to my strategic planning course next fall for the doctoral students who take it. There's about 70 or 80 every fall who do that. Uh, or at least let me share this with them, but this would be awesome to let them see how this has evolved, especially within the student affairs part, because it's, uh, as Renee and I were talking about, together we've got almost a half a century of student affairs work, and it's just, it's evolving, and it never stops, right? Thank you, thank you. I'm going to write all this down, and I'm going to hit you up um, in the summer for the fall course. Yeah, so everybody, I mean, basically the comments are, yes, it was great presentation, uh, deserving of, att of attention, raised a number of issues, important topic. So I think everybody agrees with my summation. It's fascinating. Thank you all for being here. Thank everybody for joining us today. This has been a wonderful learning opportunity for me. So if our speakers want to end up, we've still got a couple of minutes. If you wanted to say anything else. Well, thanks everybody. Thank it, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I guess I, you know, I would just, you know, reinforce what you said, Vince, and my colleagues, Bob and, and Megan. I mean, one of the things to begin to think about is, is as institutions become, uh, you know, more and more pressed in in a lot of ways, you know, the the pressure upon institutions that trying to find ways to work cross functionally helps begin those cross campus collaborations where you begin to look for opportunities to integrate your work. Uh, so it's, it's really important, especially when you begin to think about uh, resources. And of course, we're really resource challenged right now. We see it every day. Institutions are, are struggling, um, you know, cutting uh, budgets, cutting staff, cutting budgets and staff, all of that. Um, and a way, the ways to continue to deliver on your promise uh, to students, you know, really means that uh, it's going to be shared resources and collaboration. I was going to say we're all in it together. <laughs>